Chairman Fleck, uh, members of the uh, committee, I thank you very much for inviting me to make this presentation today. I was most privileged in April this year to have uh, the opportunity to meet Senator Fleck and Senator Kunz and members of the committee in Zimbabwe. I'm here as a representative of the Zimbabwe private sector, which for long has been an absent uh, partner in this process. Uh, we have not had the opportunity to have our voices heard uh, in this committee. I'm um, here not as a politician, I'm not a politician, I'm a businessman. I lead the 63 members of the Zimbabwe Stock Exchange Listed Companies Forum, which are the bulk of the private sector in Zimbabwe. Mr. Chairman, fellow members of the committee, I have already deposited my written submission, which is quite substantial. And not being familiar with the proceedings here, I uh, will summarize kind of um, my remarks uh, over and above the submission I've already made. I would like first to paint the picture uh, in Zimbabwe as we see it from the private sector point of view. First of all, and very critical to us, Zimbabwe has embarked on a difficult and very painful road of transformation. For the first time in 38 years, uh, Zimbabweans can express themselves freely. It was unheard of to experience the kind of freedom of expression that we see in Zimbabwe today during the time of Robert Mugabe. Uh, but what we observe, Mr. Chairman, is that there's a crisis of expectations. People having been in bondage for 38 years now want everything today. Uh, there's a palpable sense that, in fact, uh, solutions must be proffered now, today, or yesterday, if possible. We submit, uh, submit to Mr. Chairman, that uh, from a private sector point of view, we know how difficult it is to uh, change things and to transform Zimbabwe. And now, for the first time in four decades, we are seeing that uh, fundamental issues confronting the economy are being confronted. And there are many fundamental issues that are distortions in this economy. Fiscal indiscipline, current account imbalance, and sustainable domestic and international debt, corruption, infrastructure decay, unemployment, deepening poverty, and lack of economic competitiveness across the economy, and many more other challenges. These are well known. These are not denied. They are a reality. The fact of the matter, though, is that they are being tackled today. Our observation is that the president, with his new administration, has taken a number of very bold measures uh, to correct things. First of all, he has put in place a new team, a new cabinet, a trimmed one, a cabinet dominated by technocrats, including the Minister of Finance, the Minister of Transport, the Minister of Industry, and indeed the Minister of Roads. Uh, these people have been in office for three months. We submit that it is too early to judge them. We want to give them more time to, in fact, deliver. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, we also note that there has been a very unambiguous uh, stance taken by the President of Zimbabwe uh, to, to rejoin the International Community of Nations and to remove Zimbabwe as a pariah state. That is very clear and very unambiguous. We note, Mr. Chairman, a shift by the leadership in Zimbabwe from a narrative of politics and head speech that dominated the Mugabe era to a narrative of economic engagement and economic progress. We have noted the articulation of a vision, Vision 2030, with very clear timelines and targets to get Zimbabwe to become an upper middle class economy by 2030. Subsequent to the articulation of that vision, Mr. Chairman, uh, the Minister of Finance has articulated a transitional stabilization plan, the TSP, which gives very clear guidelines as to how Zimbabwe will emerge in the next two years from where it is today to the desired destination. And subsequent to that, on the 22nd of November, the Minister of Finance has put together a budget uh, that uh, has been dubbed austerity for posterity, which is also showing very uh, aggressive targets in terms of fiscal balance and current account balance. Mr. Chairman, uh, we have uh, observed from the private sector a desire by government to aggressively reform state enterprises, which have for long been a burden on the fiscals in Zimbabwe. And we have seen an aggressive uh, uh, timetable for aligning Zimbabwe's laws to the 2013 constitution uh, of Zimbabwe 
Today, Mr. Chairman has got 299 statutes on his books. Of the 299 statutes, 206 have already been aligned to the Constitution, and uh, there's the remaining 49 statutes that remain to be aligned to the Constitution. Among those 49 are the two controversial pieces of legislation, IPA, and of course, uh, the um, uh, 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 legislation to do with uh, the restriction of uh, freedoms in Zimbabwe. I'm advised very uh, authoritatively that both legislations will be, in fact be appearing before parliament for review and possibly for uh, repeal in the latter part of the life of this parliament. Mr. Chairman, I would like to uh, share with this house the challenges that uh, face Zimbabwe post the elections in Zimbabwe, political polarization, uh, the current volatility, the persistent shortages of foreign currency, the inflationary pressures that are underway currently, and of course the unresolved issues retaining to land reform. We note that our government has taken uh, some very fairly bold measures with regard to land reform. First of all, uh, bringing in uh, a, a sustainable land tenure system through the introduction of uh, uh, the 99A lease program, which uh, will see land being transferable and which will see security of tenure among the land owning classes. Uh, contrary to Mugabe's previous uh, practices, uh, farmers of all color and creed have been allowed to come back into Zimbabwe to form joint ventures with existing landowners so that they can put land to protect progressive use. We have seen, in fact, a number of uh, white farmers coming back into Zimbabwe as a result of that consequence, that consequential reform. Mr. Chairman, uh, a large part of the reform that we have seen recently is also the revision of indigenization laws. This has taken the private sector in Zimbabwe by surprise because they were bold, they were unexpected, and they were substantial. Uh, today, as we speak, uh, the uh, law requiring uh, uh, any investor to have to cede 55% of their equity to locals has been removed. And what we have now is a situation where investors can come into any sector of the economy except for two, platinum and diamonds, and have a majority shareholding in those sectors. Mr. Chairman, uh, I would like to... Uh, conclude my remarks by uh, making a number of uh, comments. Uh, the first is that uh, Zimbabwe is on the cusp of major economic transformation. We believe that the president shows resolve, shows courage, shows determination, in fact, to push those reforms forward. Uh, we do not believe that at any time since Zimbabwe's independence uh, we have had a leader of that fortitude and resolve. He's fully aware, in fact, that uh, the road ahead is going to be very painful, uh, but I think we believe that he is probably the person that can push those, those reforms to uh, fruition in the period ahead. Uh, we are aware, Mr. Chairman, that there's no quick turnaround. Uh, the transition will probably take anything between 12 to, to 18 months, and that that transition will be a very, very painful one indeed. Uh, Mr. Chairman, there are challenges that uh, hurdles that uh, we think the current administration is facing as it embarks on this road of transformation. The number one hurdle is, of course, the sanctions. The sanctions are real. We hear uh, talk that they are targeted sanctions, but the impact, the net impact of the sanctions on the economy of Zimbabwe is large. Uh, we are aware, of course, of the uh, country risk, which is associated with the negative uh, image that is painted as a result of sanctions. Uh, the risk premium in Zimbabwe today is anything between 20 and 25 percent. We are aware of the uh, trade restrictions. Uh, Zimbabwe is not able to access Agoa, for example, which many African countries are accessing at the moment uh, to their benefit while Zimbabwe is being left behind. We are aware of the economic sanctions, where Zimbabwe is not able to access lines of credit, uh, support from the IMF and the World Bank, and these are very serious hindrances to the ability of Zimbabwe to move forward uh, with the uh, transformation program that we have. Mr. Chairman, 
we in the private sector have taken a view. And our view is that we got to work with the government in power. We are not politicians. We give constructive criticism. We constantly engage with the president. Only two weeks ago, we met with the president. And I stood up to offer criticism to the president openly. And that is unprecedented. It is the first time that has happened. The president has opened his doors to us to offer ideas, to work with him and his team. There's only one country we have, and that country is Zimbabwe. At the age of 21, I was a political prisoner myself in Rhodesia. I know what it means to have a bold, bad political situation. In 2008, after the elections, when I was the CEO of the largest company in Zimbabwe, I took the initiative myself to bring the government and the opposition together to begin the negotiations on a government of national unity. We committed, Mr. Chairman. We want Zimbabwe to succeed. That's why I'm here today. Thank you.